You're listening to a podcast from The Word. We're joined by a brilliant folk singer and songwriter. And I have to say, in these rather troubled times, there's something very, very comforting about the fact she's been tweeting recently about rotivating and planting spuds. Normal life carries on. Kate, it's lovely to see you. Where, where actually are you? Whereabouts are you? It's in Yorkshire, isn't it? Yes, I am in a little village just outside Barnsley. And um, it's where Rusbys have dwelt for hundreds of years. In fact, my dad's traced back, I think, at least 14 generations just in this village. Wow, that's, so, yes. that's yes. incredible. Extraordinary. Absolutely, yeah. Now, what and, century are we talking about, 14 generations? So that's ooh, what I, I don't know. I don't even 16th? know. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, amazing. Isn't that? Yeah. yeah, which is actually as old as our house. That's that was sixteen something. That there was something here. You know, it's a really old, old little village, really. So yes, there's ghosts and everything lurking about. <laughs> and you used to have a studio, didn't you? That your I think your dad had built, and your uncle and your sister run. It was a kind of family concern. Have yeah, you still so, got that, or have you moved yeah. from there? Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so years ago when I first started out and the, this year we're celebrating 30 years of touring, actually, yeah. uh, when, when, when I first made an album, we decided to set up our own record label. But basically, because we're from Yorkshire and we don't trust anybody. So we set up our own little label that my dad ran for years and years. And my sister, um, like you say, has just actually taken over the, the helm of that, really. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but we I, I bought a place. Um, an old farmhouse with a barn on the side in the middle of nowhere, just about three, four miles from here. And um, so, th so the house was where I lived and my dad and my uncle converted the barn into the studio. And it was while we were making Sleepless, actually, all those years ago, I think that was 99. And so we would be in like th through the night as, as musicians are recording, creating, doing all that bit. We'd knock off at whatever, you know, six, seven in the morning. They'd roll up and then do a bit more on the studio through the day. So gradually the studio was being made at the same time the album was being made. So it was this really lovely, Fantastic. lovely thing, really. Yeah. So we, we, but we sold that. We had it about 21 years, something like that. But it was just too big. You know, technology's changed and, you know, we've got a family now. And so it was like running up and down. So we can just do most of it from home these days. Yeah. Well, look, we 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 want to go back and and and, and talk about all the, the the records that you 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 listened to when you were growing up. And we normally start with the record playing equipment in the parental home. Can you remember what it would have been? Well, I, I have no idea what make it was, but it was really good quality. I mean, my dad was a sound engineer for so many years uh, at festivals and things, you know. So um, <clears throat> so it was very good quality, whatever it was. We had no money, but things like that, you know, the important bits that would be saved for and saved for. So it was a, it, it was a, a record player. And I remember um, be, be, being allowed to use it. It wasn't too precious, even though we were taught how to look after the, the, the vinyl and look after the needle and all those kinds of things. And you had to remember to put the cover back over. So Coming it didn't get dusty. Oh yeah. yeah. Get more bass. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, right. yeah. That's right. <laughs> what records were on it? What sort of things did they play? They played so mainly folk music, really, because that's, that's where they had grown up. Well, that's, that's what they'd, they'd grown up with. That's how they met actually my parents my mum was in a band and my dad had a banjo and a van and it just was a match made in heaven. And there you go. So all these years later. But um, so, yes, it was mainly folk music, things like uh, Planksty from Ireland. Yeah. A band called Did Did uh, Did Um, They were always on. Um, I remember <clears throat> the Paul Brady and Andy Irving album actually was one of my very favourites. Um, I could, was that like eight? Oh, crikey, that might have been seventy something also. And uh, who else? Oh, loads of Nick Jones. So Nick Jones yeah. was a big favourite in the Rusby house. And actually, <clears throat> excuse me. Actually, I still don't leave home without some kind of Nick Jones CD or whatever upon my person because it is he is my musical hero. So I had this really rich, diverse kind of music lessons but within the folk scene really from all over you know even American stuff bluegrass stuff and Scottish stuff so from from all over the place but not really much else out of that out of the folk I, I can say you didn't you didn't rebel against this then because that's the natural way these yeah you, work, you didn't tear they? off and read smash hits or something or you know I did read smash hits I used to buy smash hits oh, with did you? What? yeah so, so who is on the cover 
around that time. Oh, let me think. So it would have been Aha probably around there. Yeah, yeah, Bon yeah, Jovi, yeah. you know, those kinds of things. There was Bross, Bross out then. I was not really bothered about Bross, really. But um, but Aha but you liked, Aha. did you? Hmm? Who, who was your favourite member of Aha? Oh, so it was the keyboard player, actually. I can't remember what he was called. And nobody nobody yeah. can remember his name. <laughs> How tragic it's like the is third that? member of Bross. Yeah. <laughs> he has no name. He finally gets, yeah. finally gets yeah. a name check and nobody knows his name. <laughs> oh, God. That sad. one, that keyboard player from Bross. Yeah, but I just loved their music, you know, their songs. And it felt like they had something to say. And because I'd grown up with, with this, you know, learning of folk music it's stories it's all based around stories and people and humans and you know that is something you know like you say you usually rebel against the music that your parents present to you yeah but I fell in love with it because I used to see them like mini films all the songs you know and people often said to me when I was when I first started out you know why is a young girl from Barnsley singing these songs from 200 years ago but I th- you know, for me, they're still relevant. It's about human emotion, and we're still doing all the same things that, these days that we did 200 years ago. So when any kind of music came along in pop music, you know, when I was young like that, I really loved it. And I even loved listening to Chris Berg as well, because his songs had a, they had stories, you know, yeah. like Don't Pay the Ferryman and all that, you know, it was really lovely. So, you know, but I also liked a bit of kind of throwaway pop as well that everybody else likes, you know, just the fun stuff that goes do wop, do wop, you know. But uh, but yeah, I really connected with songs that had stories, even from from the more popular music scene. Can you so remember the first you, record you bought? Yeah, go first on. single. First, so I did, and where you I, bought it actually? Yes, so there used to be a little tiny record store in Barnsley called Casa Disco. And back then, Casa it was Disco. Casa Disco, and it was tiny, and it had a listening booth in and all. And um, back then, um, you could travel anywhere in South Yorkshire for two pence on the bus. So I used wow. to take my pocket money. <clears throat> sorry. I used to take my pocket money and catch the bus into Barnsley. And um, so when, when I was buying my first album, it was a, a Bon Jovi one. And it was, is, was it called 7,800 degree, degrees Fahrenheit, I think, was the title. God, you're asking the wrong guys, but it's probably... Yeah. Oh, God. God. No, no, I'll tell you your word for it. I know. Tell you word for it. Well, yeah. you know what? I might have written that down, actually. No, no, oh, you got a list. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So, so I used to go, go in, and each week I used to pay a little bit off but and really? then I, I remember the day. So it's higher purchase, higher, yeah. yeah, yeah, on, the, on tick. Do you yeah. know, we've we've had loads of these conversations. We have never heard anybody say that before, have we, Mark? I don't no, think we. That's have. incredible. What did you have to pay? So once a week, you had to pay. You know, <laughs> it's incredible. Or something. Oh no, no, no. So 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 I used to take some in and 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 gave them a little bit of money each week, and then after like ten weeks of paying it off, I actually walked out of the shop with it. That's so I didn't have it. Like on lease, yes. I paid a oh, little bit each week. Yeah. On the instalment plan. That's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> yes. I, I never heard of that. Yeah, and, and I remember the day I walked out with it and it was actually on, on cassette. It wasn't a vinyl, it was it was cassette right. I felt all modern and came out with it in my hand. Yes. All modern. Yeah, and I looked at it. Came out with it and the tape broke. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully not. And do you know what? I, I've still got it somewhere. It's in the house somewhere. And yeah. I have no idea where. It's probably in the loft. I should have dug it out to go. Da-da. But that is the very first thing that I bought with my very own money. So there Did you are. watch Top of the Pops and things like that? Or is it or were you just getting more immersed in the in the folk world by then? I did, but I, when when I was watching Top Top of the Pops, I just used to get distracted by the people watching the the things, and like they would be talking and like dancing about, and I'd be thinking, "What are they doing? They just look really weird and uncomfortable." So that's what I used to watch. It was the back of the people's heads actually dancing. Yeah. The yeah. Acts. But if there was somebody in the charts that week that I was interested in, I would I would definitely watch it and and and, and loved it. You know, it would what a great thing. I mean. We don't have anything like that anymore, you know? So, yeah, it's sad that it went. But but when I I recorded a song with uh, Ronan Keating, I think that was in 2000 and... 
six maybe that sounds yeah. a long time ago but uh, called all over again and it got to I think it got to number six in the charts actually the single charts so I actually got to be on top of the pops oh really it, it went so I was like and I took my name tag off the door Kate was be top of the pops so I've still got that stuff oh really that's yeah. fantastic who else was on that show can you remember uh, let me think I think Katie Tunstall was on actually that was the first yeah. time I met Katie Tunstall and and then I think people that I didn't really know who they were because I was in my 30s by then, so I wasn't right. Big yeah. So, so was just, that 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 was miming, presumably, on top of the pops. You were lip syncing. I think we actually sung live, to be honest. All oh, right, okay. Yes, the 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 the, the band were miming, uh, but I think that we sung live because we did quite a few TV things, and it was a bit of a learning curve for me because obviously people use using in, in ears instead of actual monitors. And I hate them. They, they make me fall over. I get quite dizzy because I get shut off. So I had to get used to using them. So, yeah, I had to use those. So, so what's, sure. what's so unpleasant about those is it, it just <laughs> excludes the, the natural world outside. You, yes. you can only hear. Yeah, yeah. So right. so wait, if, I, I don't know if you've ever had to have any moulds made for, well, I had yeah, to have yeah, moulds yeah. made for the years. So you've got to sit in the room with these, like, rubber stuff set in yeah. in the ears. <laughs> Yeah. And you can't hear anything, and it's no. you've lost one of your senses, you know. And mm. obviously, and I didn't realize until that moment how much I actually re- rely on that, even on stage. You know, he hearing what an audience member has said, <clears throat> or I'm one sure of that's true. You know, I never thought of this before, yeah. actually. So, so because... all, all you're hearing is what is going from your microphone and what anybody's yeah. notes are being played, so you lose that. that Depth. Sense of a sense of a room, yeah. of sense yes, of where yeah. you are. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. yeah. So, when did you start performing yourself? I started performing the very first gig. So, I performed a couple of songs on a youth concert um, over Cheshire Way uh, because I'd, I'd I'd won a competition when it was. Uh, 16 or 15 even possibly at Filed Folk Festival and it was one that my dad used to do the sound at that it was one of those festivals and there was these great people that used to run a lot of the youth stuff at, as part of the festival and anyway they said they were having a competition in this pub so I'd got got my dad's dad's guitar from under the desk this massive red guild it was I could hardly get my arms around it and uh, went off up there and played a, a couple of songs. What did you sing? And I Can won. You so I, what I won with was uh, Boulder to Birmingham by Emmy Lou Harris. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Which I just loved. So uh, so I sung that and won the competition, and it meant I had to play on the final concert in the big hall with everybody else. So um, I did my slot there and went, oh, that's quite frightening. I don't think I'll do that again. Anyway, then I was at home playing, playing, playing the piano and singing. I'm, I'm self-taught, so just messing about putting songs to chords that I'd made up and that and a friend of ours called in who ran a festival in Home Firth here and uh, she said to me the festival's on in a couple of weeks you've got all right at that do you fancy doing a slot and my head nodded and inside I was going shut up no I didn't like it before. <laughs> so I went over did that and that was like a first slot on a festival I think I played for half an hour or something but Again, I was nearly sick beforehand. I could hardly walk on for one. And you were how old? Fifteen, you say? I was 16, 17, 16. something like that by then. Yeah. So how do you was, how what do you think about nervousness? It's interesting this because I think Laurence Olivier said if you're not nervous, you're not trying. You know, it's, yes. it's you know, performers are nervous, aren't they? You know, you no matter how many times you've done it, yeah. You, you sure. didn't you never let it stop you doing it, did you? No, I mean the, 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 there's been times you know, when when there's been a lot of stress and anxiety in my life that I've had to kind of deal with. And that's that's the other thing about musicians, you know, and singers. When you start talking to people about anxiety, you know, around performing and touring, and it's all that thing about the the, the tiredness, you know, and you don't realise how it's affecting your body. And then you start going, oh, what's going on? And then you get in worry and then anxious about it all. But as soon as you start talking to people, people are going, oh, I've had that or I feel that or do you get this and 
so so it's a thing that is actually in in the touring world you know and it's 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 a really funny thing that people don't talk about it but as I've got older I don't mind anymore I don't care you know about being judged or whatever it is and I always think if I can help somebody else you know I'll come come here let's have a sit down a cup of tea I'll talk to you about it and I've handed out books that have helped me over the years so, so some points in my life, that side of it have kind of got me and I've been stood on stage going, oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. But like you say, I've always finished a gig, you know? And yes. you know, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's an amazing what's, what's, what's the, what's the, the biggest crowd you've ever, you've ever played in front of? Can you remember? I think it would probably be at, so, so we did a, a BBC Radio 2 used to and I'm sure they'll they'll start it up again um since COVID. They used to do a thing called Party in the Park, I think it was, or Festival yeah, yeah, in the Park. Yeah, yeah. And it was at Hyde Park. Yeah. And and we were on the bill. It was probably about 10 years, eight years ago, something like that. And we played and it was uh, you couldn't see the back of it. I mean it was just absolutely huge. And it was the biggest thing. But again, you know, and again very nervous about it. But and, and and also because it was televised, so it's not even the audience that are there. It was like, whoop, and I knew that all my lot and all the village here were all watching and tuning in. So you, yeah. when you know that, you just like, ooh. But um, when you're playing amazing. a small club, you can, obviously you can read the 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 the, the, or the audience reaction yeah. really clearly. But when you're playing a big crowd like that, how do you get any sense of whether or not you're going down okay? Well, I, I I suppose when when we went to play that, you know, we weren't the main acts. So so there's a little bit of pressure off us. I think the yeah. course of finishing off the night that, 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 that we played As on. long as nobody throws a plastic bottle, you're probably yeah. all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but I've never been one. I don't have a false sense of grandeur, really. You know, I know where we were on that. And I know there would have been the most, mostly the people who were there in that audience would not have had a Scooby who we were. So if any of them turned around and had a listen, you know, that was great. I'm, you're winning. I'm, yes. I'm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it went down great, you know, and and uh, we had so much po- positive um, feedback from it, and new people that had discovered our music from it. So you just kind of, t- and, and and my thing is to, you know, I I always talk to the audience also, you know, obviously it's a big thing you can't talk much, um, but uh, yeah, talk to people, bring them in, you know, this is yeah. who we are, this is what we do, and that settles me also, and yeah, but it was what a thing to do, it was just amazing, brilliant. So when you when you're playing an average gig, you know club or small theater or whatever do you are you looking at the audience you can see the audience yeah do you i want to ask you this question do you address yourself to the people who don't appear to be having good time or the people who are having a good time <laughs> yeah do you try I'm and not win over the people with their arms crossed <laughs> Because there's always somebody who looks fed up. Entertain me. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. There is always somebody who's fed up. And for some reason, they always sit on the front row. I don't <laughs> know why. Like, they come you with the person who's enjoying been, it. Because their girlfriend That's has what... dragged them along or whatever. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and we they, they are the what so so usually we, we we can't you know when when we're playing in a theater you can't see much of the audience really I mean we 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 do like to have the lights up slightly so that we can but you can't really pick out individual faces or expressions totally but like you say there is always somebody sat on the front row who is not having a good time who's just like looking away and arms <laughs> crossed like you say but whenever we perform so, songs like um so I wrote a song about a superhero from Barnsley I start I wrote it for my girls but it became a whole song and now he's got his own little website you know and a video and all that and animation but I wrote this song called Big Brave Bill <clears throat> and um and we usually do it at the end of the night if it's on the set list that tour and um and there's a bit of superhero flying involved in it you know and I teach them the chorus and we get involved and that's the one that I always look at the person you know are they doing it are they doing yeah. it and yes. without doubt they're there singing along at the end, doing the flying and all that. And we've not lost one yet. Doing the fly- <laughs> so proud. Oh, that's cool. that <laughs> yes, it's just amazing. When you get that one, it's like, I've got yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you deal with the uh, the kind of, I mean, the photography nowadays is just a fact of life, isn't it? That, that people are, <laughs> they yeah. got their phones out or whatever. Have you, have you reconciled yourself <clears throat> to that at all? Yes, yes, I suppose so. But then also the the size of theatres that we play, you know, uh, 
they, there's there's the ushers around the side and they do some I mean I have noticed them sometimes you know walking in and saying could you stop doing that oh really okay. it's distracting the person behind because obviously when you've got your phone up taking a picture it's yeah, like, yeah. Isn't it? yeah so the people behind are then distracted so I don't really mind about that really <clears throat> but um yeah when, when it's when it's off-putting for other audience members then it's a bit annoying isn't it but uh but yeah, yeah I think it's it just... also must reduce the amount of applause because people are filming or they're just holding a phone, you know. That's... <laughs> oh yeah. I've not thought about it like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to say, could you put your phones down to clap, please? To I clap. That's right. <laughs> it's, like, it's like never perform in front of people who are holding a drink because yeah, they, can't they can't clap. clap. Yeah. It's as simple as that. It's true. true. That is really true. Well, what I do if I'm in that those circumstances, watching somebody stood up and I've got a drink, I always do do the old ring on the glass clap. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's good. That. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> so tell us about some of those records that you uh, are, are there, just favourite records in your life, to things that have yes. meant a lot. Yeah, yeah. So P- Penguin Eggs by Nick Jones, that is oh, yeah, fantastic. one of my very favourite ones. But then also, I mean, the less, less well-known ones. He made yeah. an album called Noah's Ark Trap which I just adore. There was a song on there called called The Wanton Seed that he's, he's got this like really cool kind of reggae feel to his guitar part, you know, and he's, he'd obviously been listening to reggae at that time. So that one I just absolutely adore. Uh, there's another one, one of Nick's called From a Devil to a Stranger, which is just one of my all-time favourites also. And uh, But then when getting a little bit older, going back to the getting the bus into Barnsley, um, I used to go to Barnsley Library and on the second floor within its own glass room, uh, they had the most amazing music library. So I used to go there uh, quite a lot when, when, when I could. And you were allowed to take two or three cassettes out each week. So I would go in there with my library card and I discovered all sorts. That's where I discovered Nancy Griffith. And I remain such a massive fan. I mean, I own all of her albums and was so sad to hear her passing. Uh, But I just, you know, she also was one of those people, like um, probably Last of the True Believers might be my very favourite album of hers. And she had that way of writing. It was so real, you know. She used to sit and watch normal people going about their business and then write the most amazing, honest songs about, about them. And the way she sung as well, she really got stuck into it, didn't she? And you could hear the emotion in her voice and it really grabbed me. So I, I discovered Nancy there. And like I say, since then got all her albums and also Lyle Lovett. He's right. another one mm. that I discovered there and just totally loved. Uh, but then also, uh, there was people like Alison Krauss, you know, I first came across Alison at Edale Bluegrass Festival. My dad used to do the sound there and it, it was literally on the Thursday they would shove the cows out of the barn, give it a once over with a bit of like flash and there was a festival in. But they would invite a band from America over every year and I saw like Del McCory band there and like I say, this year Alison Krauss's band were there. So I can't remember what album it was that they were touring at the time, but I think I was about 16 then, but just fell in love with her singing in her music. And again, when I could afford it, I bought her, all her stuff too. So, um, and Dan Kam- Tominski too, he's fantastic in that. Group. Yes, absolutely. And also Ron, Ron Block on banjo. Yeah. He's, he's become a great, great friend of ours. He's played on my last few albums, actually, Ron. So it's a funny, it, it's funny how things come, come back around, you know? And yeah. We, we, we often sit up having a glass of wine, reminiscing about about that, about Edale Festival and how strange it was, but fabulous, yeah. Dan what Kaminsky does this thing on stage where he always talks about when he got that job being the voiceover for George Clooney on yes. Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And it's, it's about telling his wife. He said, so so I'm looking at, uh, 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 I'm hearing your voice, but I'm seeing George Clooney. He said, <laughs> this is my fantasy. <laughs> 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 really, really oh, poor Dan. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that that's how I kind of explain him on stage because Dan actually sung on an album of mine. And 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 actually we've 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 redone that song. It was a song called Only Desire What You Have. 
and it first appeared on my Life in a Paper Boat album. And we've kind of re, re, rearranged it, re, redone it for this 30 album. And we've kept Dan's vocal on it because I loved it so much. So when I'm, we, we were now touring the, the songs that are on the 30 album. And, um, you know, that's how I kind of explain who Dan is. You might not know who he is, but you do. So, you know, and I say that, do you remember, oh, brother? Yeah, Will? yeah. When, when George Clooney opened up his voice to sing, that's Dan and you can hear yeah. that. No, no, incredible. Oh, right, I know that voice, right, yeah. No, he's brilliant. He's just amazing. What a singer. Just astonishing. Yeah. yeah. And it's a long tradition of that, isn't there, really, in, in musical films where the 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 actor is, uh, you know, the, the voice, singing voice has been provided by somebody else, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, West Side Story. All yeah. Those kind of things. Yeah. Uh, was they it, still do it now, don't they? I'm sure. I, I, do, do they? I don't know. You might be right. I don't know. I don't I'm know. Sure it's an interesting question. Day. I'm sure I heard somebody talking on the radio and she was the voice of somebody in uh, The Greatest Showman, I think. Oh, really? Okay. Mm. Oh, well. I might be wrong. I might be cast, casting aspersions there. I don't right. know. <laughs> <laughs> so did, did you go away to college and so forth? I, so... I was a very strange child that um, I didn't quite know what I wanted to to do. You know, I would sit at home with, with with my guitar, you know. Well, it was actually my dad's. He taught me three chords when I was about 14. I'd, I'd learned to play the fiddle from being around six, seven, something like that. And I learned at school, like classical classically but I just I really didn't didn't like it and but my pet like I was saying earlier my parents both sing and play my dad plays the banjo and mandolin string stuff like that and my mum plays piano accordion so you know I would come home and on a week we'd be on a weekend and my dad would get the banjo out you know and he'd say come on get get your fiddle out I'll teach you this tune so I that was my love you know I, I would be doing this piece of classical music at you know lessons at school and I've got to do it for another 30 weeks because my bow wasn't going in the right direction or something and I just switched off and lost interest in that side of it but at home I could play nobody cared which way my bow was going I was learning listening and learning and I've always been a bit rubbish at reading and reading music I can do it but I'm very slow and I, I can't I never understood bass clefs it's like when I got to fractions oh my word no that's it I've lost it in math now. Uh, but um so I always did everything by ear but which kind of held me back for doing any like GCSE music the only they, they, they would let me take the exam but and with focusing a bit more on the performance side and 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 the, the listening exam but they would only ever let me get up to a grade C they wouldn't wouldn't let me have a B or a or an A however good my answers were or however uh-huh. it was it was just the rule then and I'm sure it's changed now but you know at that age all my friends were going oh I'm taking these subjects because I'm going to be uh, this or that and I was going around going, how on earth do you know? Like, we're, we're 14. How do you know what you're going to be? Or 15 or 16. So they all knew. And I just took the took the subjects that I enjoyed, you know, art, drama, music, biology, things like that. And, uh, you know, when, when I was coming to the end of um, my schooling, um, I had no idea still what I wanted to be. And we have a brilliant performing arts college in Barnsley. Back then it was called the Electric Theatre. So you go there when you're 16 for two years. And I did a BTEC in in, in performing arts. Uh, But I specialised in in the drama because I'd already done a lot of music. You could specialise in the music, the the technical side, dance or drama. Drama was the only one I'd not done much of, really. So I did that. And again, you know, I enjoyed it. I was no, I was wasn't very good at it, but you know, I just got on with it and loved it. But it was while I was there that our friend asked if I would go to home first to do that gig. And when I came off the the the, the stage, there was somebody else there who ran another festival down south in Sidmouth, which is quite a big festival. And he said to me, oh, I really enjoyed that. Do you fancy coming to Sidmouth next month? And again, it was the head nodding, saying, oh, thank you very much. And <laughs> I'm going, sure up. And I went and did that. And somebody else asked me. And it was this really organic thing. And then when I'd finished that, uh, that course at, in, at, at college, I thought, you know what? I'll just give this a moment and see where it goes, because I still have no idea what I'd do at university. And in that year, so many more people, like folk clubs and things like that, asked me to play so I thought oh I'll have another year out and see where it goes and I never went 
So it just chose, right. really, yeah. So folk clubs were your university, really, or college, or whatever. They, yeah, yeah, folk, folk clubs and and, and 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 folk festivals as well. Yeah, and it, to be honest, it was where I was so happy because I'd been taken to so many of the festivals already and folk clubs because my dad did the sound, you know, and I used to go and help him and I used to love sitting and listening, you know, to whoever was playing. So I was really, com- but I never thought for one minute when I was younger that that's what I would end up doing and I do feel it chose me rather than the other way around yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you noticed we appear to have lost Mark Ellen this is the first time this has happened he's obviously had some some technological <laughs> challenge that he, he couldn't overcome no we're still here he, <laughs> I just realized there he is <laughs> coming back He's how are you there, Mr. I'm Ellen? So sorry. So well, join sorry. hands and see if we can contact the recently <laughs> departed. I'm Mark so Ellen. sorry. You you... Put on yeah, there you are. You're back. There I am. I didn't know what happened. The signal suddenly went. Um it's all right. I'm Don't back. Worry. I'm sorry. Did you pause yeah, or did you carry on? We yeah, no, yeah. we kept going. We kept going. Good, we good, just good. we just noticed that you're gone. Yeah, thank you. you. I'm so okay, sorry. Okay, Kate, Kate what... was talking about how she didn't go to didn't go to college, but uh Folk clubs were kind of became her college because one yeah, thing yeah, yeah. led to another. So yes. you're, you're you're currently on tour. Yes. Is that an extensive tour? Uh, it is. So we we tour until the end of May, the very end of May, and uh, then we have a little bit of break from it <clears throat> uh, because the obviously took touring the album, but then also there's so many gigs in this year and also in next year because of course two years worth of gigs have yeah. been rolled over so you know at the age i am now i have to do like four gigs and then go home for a few days and then go out again but Quite we right can't though. do that this time so it, there's so many gigs that had kind of rolled over so i'm really looking forward i mean we've, we've, we've started we've done three or four of the of the tour so far and absolutely loving being back in that situation of of playing and performing and you know, still here, people are a bit tentative about buying tickets in advance. So it's a nervy time if you're promoting your own gigs, which is what we do. You know, we've done that for years. So, um, so it, yeah. So how, how, do you, how do you do that, promoting your own gigs? Well, I well, mean, you, you just got a list of venues and you just ring them up and say, we can come on the Wednesday. Is that how it works? Kind of. Yeah, it's yeah. like that. We, we, we decide when we're touring. We, we know geographically where one might sit after another. And we work about 18 months in advance. And it's, li- it's li- literally that, getting in touch with the venue, saying, can we hire your venue? Because that, that, that's what we end up doing now. Because when I'd kind of done the folk clubs and things and I'd kind of outgrown them, and again, it was so organic. You know, too many people wanted to come to the gig and they couldn't buy tickets in advance because folk clubs didn't work like that. And I just felt awful, all these people who didn't get in. So we did the local arts centre and then right. again, that was full. So we built up like that. But when we got to the theatres, we would ring people up and they'd say, oh, no, we're not going to book, we don't, don't put, book folk music here. Nobody comes to folk music. What are you talking about? So we <laughs> it, then we went, well, how much is it to hire? You know, so we thought, well, let's take a risk. And that's what we've done ever since, really. Yeah. But most of our gigs we, we've we put on and we look after and, yeah. So, so do, you, do you do your own merchandising and all that kind of stuff? Absolutely, because we still have our own our own record company, so we get all the albums printed and the t shirts and all that kind of stuff, and we we go on tour. And actually, it's, it's my nephew that comes with us to sell the merch. And I was going to say, it's got to be a family. Family. It's, it's always a family, family member. member. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> are you still it. doing the underneath the stars festival? You are, I think, this year. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we only missed one. Thank, thankfully, we 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 just still went ahead with our festival last year, but we changed it. Usually, it's in massive marquees, so because yeah. we like comfort and the audience do, you know, and we try and make the sound as good as it can be and all that. But 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 last year we had to go with one huge outdoor stage, so people just had space, you know. I mean, but then you're you're open to the elements, of course, and in Yorkshire it rains quite a bit. But yeah. No, I will not have that said. <laughs> <laughs> Does it? Yeah. That's Lancashire. Yeah. <laughs> I was like the Pennines, that's where all yeah. the bloody rain yeah. is. I think it just blew know. over. That must be what have happened. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, we traditionally finish these these chats by asking people to tell us what is the greatest record ever made? Do you know the answer to that question? Kate? There is no wrong answer. This is an education you know for what? us. 
I have so many answers, and it's impossible to choose, as I'm sure it would be for you. Yeah, give us, give oh. us four, give us your top five. Oh, top five. So, being re- records as in actual tracks. Um, well, it, it can be LPs, singles, albums, whatever. whatever. Tracks. Ah, uh, well, album, greatest album ever made. I would go for "Last of the True Believers" uh, by Nancy Griffith. Right. Oh, well, Griffith. okay. Yeah, I just absolutely adore. I adore the the songs on it. The way she sings, the, the she was in a prime yeah, then, you know, it was just absolutely beautiful and gorgeously produced and just amazing. But if I was having to choose one song, it would probably it would either be um Sally Wheatley by Bob Fox and Stu Luckley. I don't know if you've heard it. No, no, no. no. Bob Fox is one of the greatest singers ever on the planet. He's a tra- tra- traditional singer from up in the uh, the northeast, and he has this. Is he, he sings like a bird? Is is how I can only describe it. He's one of those people when you see him sing, it is no effort at all. It is this voice just comes out. He's always banging tune. His decoration that he does, it's like he was just born to sing. And Bob Fox and Stu Luckley were. Uh, Stu Luckley is also from up, up in the Northeast and they were, were a duo back in the 70s. So I think that album was 1978. It came out that Sally Wheatley is on and it's the two of them. And Stu Luckley plays acoustic bass and Bob play, play, plays guitar and they do a bit of harmonies with each other as well. But Bob sings Sally Wheatley and it is just it breaks your heart to hear him sing it. And it's one of those tracks when you hear it, it, it never dates because it's so amazing. It'll never go out of fashion. You know, it's it, it's one of those that is just so brilliant. And I listen to it now and it still makes me cry, not because the song is so sad, just because it's so beautiful. It's the most beautiful piece of music that I think I've ever heard. So I if should I go to immediately watch, to listen to yeah, it. Yeah, a brilliant we should, description. We'll really, dig that really out. Good. Kate, it's been lovely to talk to you. Uh, as we always say, good luck with the tour. Yeah, good luck with the tour. <laughs> <laughs> Climbing on Wogan. <laughs> yes. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. Hey.